So while I was sleeping, we had a rocket attack. Well, I was awake, but I didn't hear it actually, the impact. Uh, I then fell back asleep. So I've actually stayed in the building there uh, to the right. Just over there, it's a door building. Yeah, another terrorist attack on us here in Odessa by Russia. Sar experience. Privet and greetings from Odessa, Mama. It is day 143 of Russia's invasion of Ukraine. As you saw in that quick clip, I started today's video with just behind me somewhere there, we got struck by a Russian missile attack this morning in the early hours of the morning. So this is just wanted to kind of emphasize the the raw reality that this is a war zone. It's not just an intellectual sphere when we discuss these topics. In particular, the video that I'm going to react to today, which was sent to me by so many people over the last, like I think it's about five days old at this stage, and it is from Jordan Peterson. Now, most people who are going to watch this video, I think, know who Jordan Peterson is. But to recap, he is a YouTube, I guess, phenomenon because his very academic lectures went viral here on YouTube a few years ago. He's a clinical psychologist from Canada. And I think he hit the uh, height of his popularity, the apogee of his fame uh, here on YouTube when he did an interview with Channel 4 and Kathy Newman, who is a woke feminist um, journalist, uh, TV presenter. I think that's a fair way to describe her. And that video almost I think broke the YouTube uh, algorithm in terms of popularity for such a type of like TV interview on a pretty obscure type of character, a clinical psychologist slash professor from Canada. And it has been viewed over 38 million times, just the version that is on uh, Channel 4's YouTube channel, right? And, you know, he endeared me, himself to me quite a bit with that interview. And since then, he wrote a book, or he had written a book at the time called 12 Rules for Life. He wrote a sequel. So basically, he's, um, at least three or four years ago, I guess, he was a massive figure in this kind of, I guess, anti-woke, anti-wokeism movement in the West, kind of a counter-movement in the West. So since then, he has had some issues with some addiction problems. And I'll come back to that at the end of this reaction video because it is, I think, actually very relevant to the position that he takes, unfortunately. And let's get into it and see this um, video. Actually, one last thing I want to say just before I play it for you, and I'm going to react to a few clips. It's quite a long one. I'll put the link to the full Jordan Peterson in, uh, video down below. It's called Russia versus Ukraine or Civil War in the West. In that book, 12 Rules for Life, his rule number one is stand up straight with your shoulders back kind of to face the world. It's connected to serotonin, which is in our brain, also with lobsters, stuff to do with status. Anyways, that's another topic, but again, we'll circle back to that particular rule at the end of the reaction video. So let's get into it and see what he has to say. Hi, everyone. I want to read a piece for you today that I wrote recently over about a month, carefully assessing it with a number of experts on foreign policy. It's called Russia versus Ukraine or civil war in the West. So I should start off by saying that Jordan Pearson does oppose and condemn Russia's invasion of Ukraine and the Eastern Orthodox Church's support of it in Russia. So that's the first thing. He's not saying that the war is good, that he's pro kill all the Ukrainians, kill all the people around me, including me, I guess, since I'm here in Odessa and Ukraine at the moment in some sort of genocide. But Let's see how he analyzes the war. Dr. Kagan essentially put forward the thesis that Vladimir Putin is a prototypical authoritarian and that Russia's foray into Ukraine might be properly viewed as an expression of the imperial expansionism that characterized the Soviet Union. So this is Cold War round two. So there he puts forth the thesis by uh, Dr. Kagan that basically 
Vladimir Putin is an authoritarian imperialist and this war is just a continuation of previous imperialism in the region, Soviet imperialism, although the Soviets claimed that they weren't imperialist or Marxism, but in reality they were. And of course, Russian uh, imperialism that preceded it. And that's, yeah, although that I agree, but does Jordan Peterson agree with that? But one of the primary justifications for a war, perhaps, is that we have something to gain. I see that we have little to gain in the current situation. And certainly, much we could lose. Russia is a nuclear power. And we run the very real risk of backing them into a corner. I find it interesting that Jordan Pearson here, he has this very sinister lighting on himself. He's almost like a little bit of a intellectual Bond villain here. <laughs> and he's outlining that we have a lot to lose. Russia's a nuclear power. Of course, we know all that, but you know, when you're dealing with such an aggressive, violent, dangerous individual, powerful individual like Vladimir Putin, who has started this war that we don't know how many people have been killed as a result of the war so far. Could be 100,000 people. It's definitely in the tens of thousands. Russian soldiers alone, it's probably more than 20,000 dead. I've been probably conservative when I say that. And on the Ukrainian side, it's probably something similar than all the civilians who were killed. But to say that, well, we have a lot to lose. So if we are in this war, if we support Ukraine, I think is the implication here. Uh, yeah, but we also have a lot to lose if we don't do it, if we don't support Ukraine, which is like what appeasement means. Appeasement, if it just um, encourages further adversarial and aggressive behavior by the person that you appease, then you're going to end up losing even more in the long run. So it's not a really cogent argument to me to do nothing. Dr. Mearsheimer's remarkably prescient 2015 University of Chicago lecture, Why is Ukraine the West's Fault? And then he outlines a pretty famous video from John Mearsheimer. I've actually reacted to it myself. I'll put it up on the card down below in the description, where basically Mearsheimer just basically blames the West and kind of takes agency away from Russia because in reality, Mearsheimer thinks that we should live like in the 19th century. He says that's the way of the world. He is a doyan in the field of international relations and he supports a theory of what is known as offensive neorealism. That means that basically the big countries just gobble up the, the small countries as applies to this case here. Russia is big. Ukraine is relatively small. Ukraine is actually not that small. It's 40 million people. It's big. Uh, geographically, it's the biggest country located entirely in Europe. Fortunately for Ukraine, Russia is the biggest country in the world geographically and it happens to be on its on its border. One thing that about Mearsheimer's video that is quite famous and that circulated is all the West's fault is that in that video he says that Vladimir Putin is way too clever to invade Ukraine in basically the way he has. Uh, but since he's gone and done it, Mearsheimer doesn't actually just call Putin out and he keeps basically blaming the West. So anyways, I'll link that video up if you're really interested in listening to Mearsheimer, but it seems that Peterson goes along with that analysis. I was concerned that Mearsheimer might be a Russian apologist in some relatively simple manner, although that does not seem to be the case. Mearsheimer is not a Russian apologist. He basically supports going back to 19th century uh, imperialism. He thinks that's the way the world should be. So maybe not directly, and he doesn't say, go Russia, genocide the Ukrainians, but he supports that that's the way the world will work. So it's not really... So in a way, he is a Russian apologist for Vladimir Putin's uh, imperialism. And Vladimir Putin has outlined it very clearly that he thinks he's Peter the Great. Uh, and he's been talking consistently for about the last year and a half. In many videos I've seen Vladimir Putin answer questions is that he keeps talking about 19th century history or even earlier history, 18th century history, and placing himself in that realm. Uh, you can go and look at um, why I say he... Compared to all the Peter Great, another video up above in the card down below in the description. So let's fast forward to where I think, like Jordan Peterson is clearly someone who is quite intellectual, I would say quite smart, based on his work that I watched a couple of years ago. Uh, but there's no evidence, or he hasn't spoken about his time here in Ukraine or his time in Russia. He's, he's not really got any experience here in the region, it would seem, um, since he's been based in Canada and he's never talked about, you know, spending a summer here on the shores of Black Sea in Odessa, for example. I think if you're watching everything from 
afar the whole time, it's very easy to mm, fall into one side or the other's uh, narrative. So let's just listen to what he says next. Mearsheimer also claims that the Ukraine president, Yanukovych, deposed in 2014 in the aftermath of widespread pro-EU protests, was the clear favorite and choice of the Russian-speaking Ukrainians who overwhelmingly occupy the southeastern section of the country, while Zelensky, the current president and supporter of all things Western, was and is supported by the Ukrainian speakers who live in the Northeast. Now, this is a very basic mistake to, to make in terms of understanding what's happening in Ukraine because he conflates what happened in 2014 with the overthrow of the Yanukovych government uh, where Yanukovych in the previous elections 2010 he was supported um, and his por party, the party of the regions, got most of its support from here in the south cities like Odessa, also Crimea and then in the east places like Donetsk, Luhansk, um, I think Kharkiv as well and then his adversary at the time or his other adversaries would have been Yulia Tymoshenko she got most of her support from the center and from the west of the country and you know Russian is spoken more in cities like here in the south or in the center or in the east of Ukraine and Ukrainian is spoken more in the other regions. However, he then conflates that with Zelensky. Zelensky became the president in 2019. So there had been an interim president while they arranged elections in 2014 and Petro Poroshenko, who's actually from, he's actually born here in Odessa Oblast, but he grew up in Vinitsa. Uh, in the central west of Ukraine, which is more Ukrainian speaking, he became president uh, until 2019 when he lost an election to Volodymyr Zelensky. Oh, I'm silent. So then he lost this election to Volodymyr Zelensky. Now, Zelensky basically won in the entire country. He didn't just win in the northwest. In fact, Poroshenko, I think, lost everywhere except for somewhere in the west. So he's got that completely wrong. And uh, Zelensky is also a native Russian speaker. So that makes absolutely no sense to talk about the people in the South and the East uh, that he wasn't their choice. He, I mean, he is one of them if you want to define it Russian speakers in that kind of way. But his native language is uh, Russian. He also had a career was, he, in Russia, not just in Ukraine. Um, he's also Jewish, uh, so he's not, we'll say, uh, from the Greek, uh, what is it called, the Greek Catholic, Catholic, Greek Catholic um, Church, or what is that called, Greek Ukrainian Catholic Church in the west of Ukraine, a Ukrainian speaker, maybe from a very traditional conservative part of the west of Ukraine, he's actually from a big industrial city called Krivi Rig, uh, where Russian would be the main language that is spoken, I've been there myself, it's uh, pretty short, uh, similar to the other industrial cities that have a lot of Russian speakers because the during the Soviet times, people were brought to work in those factories from all over the Soviet Union. So that's a huge mistake to make. He is actually the candidate of more or less the entire country. He won with 73% of the vote. He's a native Russian speaker. He, was, he got more votes here than probably in the West. Uh, so it makes absolutely no sense what he, what he says, and that's a pretty big mistake to make. The fact that the Ukrainian-speaking supported government has placed increasingly draconian restrictions on the language rights of the Russian speakers in the Northwest. So what is draconian? Um, what language restrictions are there? Well, before the revolution in 2014, there was a regional language law, which meant that if there were a certain number of speakers of a minority language, uh, in this case, maybe in Odessa, it's going to be Russian, right? Then you can conduct your business on the city level or the oblast, the regional level in that language, in addition to the right to do it in Ukrainian. And that law was abrogated after the revolution, which means that there is only one official language in Ukraine. So you do have to conduct your official business with the state in Ukrainian. And on top of that, the law for language of instruction in, in, in university and in schools in general should be in Ukrainian. Now, is that draconian? Well, you can have a bit of a debate about that. I wouldn't call it draconian. It could be more liberal or supportive of the Russian language or the Hungarian language or the Romanian language or the Bulgarian language, which is spoken by minorities here, Crimean Tartar language, another one. 
but to call it draconian, it's not like Russian is banned. Like basically you can walk around even in wartime here in Ukraine when Russia has invaded here in Odessa and 99% of the people are speaking in Russian. So it's not like Russian is banned. If you listen to a lot of Russian propaganda, you're gonna get the impression that you're basically gonna be hunted down, beaten up or murdered if you speak in Russian in Ukraine. It's absolutely ridiculous in the cities where people overwhelmingly speak Ukrainian as obviously ipso facto Lavrov, the Russian foreign minister in an interview I reacted to, which is completely Orwellian uh, with Stephen Rosenberg of the BBC. Again, I'll link it up above in the card down below in the description. He claims that, which is absolutely, I mean, Lavrov cannot be that stupid or misinformed. Obviously, he knows that's not true. So that again is a pretty big fundamental mistake to, to make. And if John Prince has never actually been here to Ukraine, which seems to be the case, uh, what news sources or information is he relying on in order to come to that conclusion? Because it makes absolutely no sense. The fact all Westerners balancing the complexities of multiple languages in their own countries should be particularly sensitive to and understanding of. All this to say that Putin and the Russians have their reasons for concern over the situation in Ukraine. There he seems to agree with one of the what I would call bogus Casas Belli by Russia, that Russian speakers are oppressed in Ukraine. Well, that's again going back to what I said, where is he getting his information from if that's what he believes? Um, does he think that, for example, um, Russian speakers in the Baltics are oppressed because they also don't have Russian as an official language? Is it that if there's any minority, like for example, should we say in the UK that Urdu or Hindi should be uh, also national languages of language rights? Uh, should we say that maybe Arabic and French should be an official language of the country? Because I'm not sure how many Arabic speakers there are exactly, but I guess 5% would be kind of a good ballpark figure um, as a first language. Are they oppressed? So I would argue no but obviously Jordan Peterson doesn't agree with me. Now he makes a few odd mistakes. A lot of commenters um, made a big deal out of, like he got mixed up between the Caspian Sea and the Black Sea. Obviously the Black Sea is over there. We don't have here in Ukraine access to the um, Caspian Sea. That would be on the other, you know, in the past on the other side of the Black Sea. I mean, that's countries like Azerbaijan, or, uh, Kazakhstan and Russia. And also he, at the end of the video, makes this very bizarre mispronunciation of the Holodomor that will be, we'll get to, um, but I think that's just a slip of the tongue. Still, since he's getting a lot of fundamental things wrong, also seems a bit strange to make that. And he's obviously put a lot of time into uh, preparing himself for this particular video. Third, Russian concern about maintaining its primarily petro-funded economy, particularly in relation to the European market. But even three reasons are not enough to account for the fact of this war. So the first three reasons he gave are actually pretty reasonable. And here we get to the real crux of this video and the title. So remember, the title of the video is Russia versus Ukraine or Civil War in the West. There's a fourth, precisely germane to why I entitled this essay, Civil War in the West. In the West, no, not in the Russian Empire. So we're all good. End of the air alert, so we didn't get bombed this time in the city center. When Alexander Solzhenitsyn wrote The Gulag Archipelago, the book that shook the foundations of the Cold War era world, he suggested, like Dostoevsky, that it would be necessary for the Russians to return to the path of incremental organic development that had been manifesting itself prior to the revolutionary disruptions of the communist catastrophe. That meant a return to orthodox belief. So there he ties in in an extremely long way. I don't know how many minutes he went on for there. Is it like about five? To say the fourth reason that um, Russia started this war is to defend orthodoxy, Christian orthodoxy. They just invaded a country that's, if it has a religion, a majority religion, it's going to be orthodox Christianity. 
So that's, there's a paradox to start off with that he, I don't think he mentions anywhere in his hour long uh, video uh, essay is uh, then why are they invading a country that's also orthodox and ostensibly trying to commit a genocide to, in order to control it. Video up above and a card down below if you want to know more why I describe it as a prima facie case for genocide committed by Russia here in Ukraine. Um, absolutely baffling this. There's every sign of a revival of Christianity in Russia, including a veritable storm of church building and cathedral construction. Putin himself is, in principle, a practicing Christian. So then he goes into, I'd say, about half an hour, which obviously I'm not going to play for you, you can go watch the whole video, where he basically he connects what he thinks is Vladimir Putin's belief in Orthodox Christianity. Um, I'm a bit skeptical about that. I think it's just convenient for Vladimir Putin to use the Orthodox Church as a bulwark, a, a, a buttress for his power, right, to make sure that, you know, he has another um, institution in the country that's going to back him because he's backing them. But maybe, maybe Peterson generally believes that Vladimir Putin is a good Christian boy. And he then goes on to talk about wokeism in the West, which obviously... No surprise for anyone who's watched my channel for a while. I'm going to have a lot of sympathy for Jordan Peterson's arguments on that. He talks about basic nomination of the um, recent nomination of a Supreme Court judge in America, that the first thing they wanted was a woman and a black woman, not the most competent person. Um, so this is a very, very, very long tangent to go on when we're talking about Vladimir Putin. If you think Vladimir Putin is invading Ukraine uh, to help maybe white men get elected to the U.S. Supreme Court. I find that a bit of a stretch. Hmm. Anyways, let's go. If you want to sit through, as I said, half an hour of Jordan Pearson talking about this, then you can go watch the videos down below in the description. Let's just go to the end and see what conclusion he comes to about how we should react to this war in Ukraine as a result of what he's outlined as the reasons for it. All protestations to the contrary. None of us give a damn about Ukraine. Uh, really, Jordan Peterson, none of us? I mean, I see maybe you don't give a damn about it, but to say no one gives a damn about it, I don't know who he thinks his audience is. Uh, he's like him being Canadian, the biggest, we'll say, uh, national lobby group from what I understand in Canada is Ukrainian Canadians. So if he's talking to his domestic audience, eh, there are a lot of people who do care about what happens in Ukraine. And globally, um, the amount of attention this war has gotten, rightly, because it is, for a little bit to agree with Jordan Pierce, there is a risk of a conflagration which would lead to nuclear war here in Europe. It is a very serious um, situation that we have, especially for Europeans, but also for the whole globe. Rightly, a lot of people do care. I'm saying that the casual observer in Guatemala who's struggling with their daily life, really going to care so much? Probably not, but a lot of people do care and they do care for a good reason. So I find that just a bit of a strange assertion to make. And never have. And never have. <laughs> Remember the Holomador? Do you even know what it was? Well, there he, as people made out, uh, pointed out, he completely made a hash of pronouncing the Holodomor, which means hunger, it's a famine. It's a man-made famine by Stalin uh, during the Soviet times that killed millions and millions of Ukrainians, in particular also Russians and Moldovans and people in Central Asia. Stan killed a lot of people, of course, the deaths of an enormous number of Soviet citizens, as well as people in other countries. And it started in the early 30s. You had the main part of the Holodomor. It actually was repeated after World War II, which few people actually do realize that if you ever want to prove that it wasn't an accident, is that he went and he did it again. And he did it in the parts of the Soviet Union that they newly acquired basically as a result of the Second World War. So Moldova, parts of Western Ukraine. And they went and did it again and killed large numbers of people through famine. They basically collectivized the farms. Uh, basically, if you were a productive farmer, well, everyone had their land taken off them. And then if you were a productive farmer in particular, you were going to be pretty upset that now basically you had to give all your crops to the state. It was all going to be centralized. And um, yeah, if you're the one being super productive, obviously you got very little back from the state in return. Those people were obviously not going to go along with it. So basically they got starved to death, if not shot um, by 
Stalin's secret police. So, um, and to say about the Holodomor, it's also recognized in many countries as a genocide. Well, for the Russians, Ukraine is akin in some important sense to Russia itself, even more so than the Monroe Doctrine Western Hemisphere is the US. I'm not saying that Ukraine is part of Russia or that the Ukrainians agree with the Russians. Oh, well, I guess that makes it fine though. The Russia just thinks it's part of Russia. But our current concern is very self-aggrandizing and unreliable. And this is particularly true given that we in the West that opposes Russia have very much to lose in this battle. We have not yet woken up fully to what that loss will look like. So there he just points out uh, that the West, us, I guess is the audience, that probably both of us are majority speaking to, has a lot to lose. Uh, so his conclusion is basically going to be appease Russia. But <laughs> that's not a very good way to assess the two uh, courses of action, is it? Because if you appease Putin and then he says, oh, thanks very much, I've just taken Ukraine, He'll have to um, subdue the people here. He'll do that through, um, you know, forcing people out, killing them, uh, destroying their idea of nation, their culture, everything. Committed genocide, basically, at the end of the day. Um, and then, do you think he's going to stop? Because I think, imagine we had done that with Hitler. We just decided to appease him. Ah, that's right. We, that, that's exactly what Neville Chamberlain uh, tried to do. He came back infamously in 1938 with a white piece of paper saying peace in our time i, I just gave him you know uh parts of central europe but he's going to stop there right right oh now he's in poland well of course appeasement worked terribly with hitler because he just saw well first of all he wasn't in a very strong position so as he gained more territory he actually became stronger and stronger and a bigger threat that's the first thing so uh if russia were to quickly have quickly have taken Ukraine, they could have just, you know, looted all the resources here and built their military bigger and then pushed on into the next country. Actually, I don't even think they would have stopped for very long. They would have gone straight into neighboring Moldova because Moldova doesn't really have a military. So, and there is the separatist enclave, this pro-Russian called Transnistria. Once they got in there, and that's actually a stated mil Russian military objective by some of their commanders, boom, they would have just gone taken the rest of Moldova if Moldova didn't agree to do what they want. So, uh, and then they would have taken a pause, rearmed, and come for maybe the Baltics next, to the Slovakia Gap, maybe Poland, maybe northern Kazakhstan would be their next victim because, well, actually Tokayev, the president of Kazakhstan, and Vladimir Putin are having a lot of contretemps, a little bit of conflict at the moment, and Russia could apply the same casus belli, more or less, to just justify, uh, to themselves at least, seizing northern Kazakhstan. And, uh, you know, you just go on and on. I mean, Putin at one stage was KGB agent in Dresden in Germany. From his worldview and his experience, well, they've effectively controlled half of Germany. <laughs> Where is the limit in his mind? Even before he goes with, I mean, you know, creating more expansionism than the Soviet Union, right? He doesn't even, in his mind, even think it's expansionism. He's just saying, I'm just taking back what we had originally when I was in the KGB and stationed in East Germany at the time. I mean, him from expansion would be going, taking Denmark maybe, and then the Netherlands and Belgium. You might say, well, he'll never get that far. Yeah, he won't get that far ever because, well, there are nuclear powers that stand in his way in an alliance called NATO. That would be the US, the United Kingdom, France. But the countries until then, they don't have nuclear weapons. So Germany apparently doesn't really seem to have much of a military at the moment. Anyways, I digress. Let's go back to what he continues to say. Allow me, therefore, to prognosticate both pessimistically and worse, realistically. I believe that all of the following consequences are already inevitable. First, skyrocketing energy prices. I firmly expect oil prices to hit $300 a barrel or worse in the upcoming year or two. The idiot environmental policies that we insist on pursuing not least in Justin Trudeau's increasingly dysfunctional Canada, are exacerbating this problem unforgivably. And it has become obvious in countries such as the UK and Germany that the hypothetically compassionate and working class positive green types and their ilk are perfectly willing to sacrifice today's actual poor 
to the hypothetically thriving poor of their imaginary future utopia. Second, severe food shortages, or even famine, for a minimum of 150 million people. So there he talks about, well, the move to green energy will be kind of scuppered by all of this because energy prices will be really high. We'll need to probably compromise on what this green, um, green deal, I guess, is. Uh, and, well, maybe it'll actually mean that Germany or Europe will build more nuclear power plants. That actually might be a good consequence, I would argue personally, since nuclear energy is, aside from the possibility of a big accident, obviously like a Chernobyl or Long Island, pretty clean form of energy. So, and then the second one he brings up is world famine. Yeah, that's a possibility, but you know, we're pretty industrious as a species. Maybe we can figure out some ways to grow more crops and produce more food. Uh, maybe the obese in the West should stop eating so much. Might be one way to solve that, being a little bit facetious with that. But yeah, they're the two things that he thinks that we, reasons for uh, appeasing Vladimir Putin, just letting him take Ukraine, and then obviously move on when he gets an opportunity and attack somewhere else. It's a bit, a bit of a weak That's argument, in my opinion. The countries most affected by the aforementioned food shortage will be precisely those North African and Middle Eastern nations from which the last mass migration that so stressed Europe, to say nothing of the immigrants themselves. Expect immense mass movements of desperate people by November of 2022, and all the exacerbation of religious and nationalist tension and internal polarization along political fracture lines that accompanies a sudden and uncontrollable influx of people. If the buildup of NATO forces continues, and they are in fact then moved into battle position, a real likelihood of the use of tactical nuclear weapons on the Russian side to deal with that threat. 300,000 have been very recently put on high readiness, prepared for immediate deployment, as opposed to the 40,000 currently available for rapid reaction. All this appears to be based on the assumption that the Russians will back down if threatened enough. Yeah, that's called deterrence. It's not a very new con uh, concept. This didn't work for the Germans with regards to Britain in the days of the Blitz. Why would we underestimate the determination of the Russians? And he makes a weird analogy with the Blitz. Germany was trying to invade uh, Britain. I don't understand him at all. <laughs> I don't see the connection between putting a deterrence like NATO troops in the Baltics and in Central Europe to stop Russia, even thinking about coming and trying to take more territory if they were to take Ukraine in his scenario where he seems to just assume that they're going to get that far. Uh, if we arm Ukraine enough, the argument is that they will just be defeated here, the Russian army, and that they will eventually just have to go home. There is a risk, of course, that when that happens, Russia may is a kind of a Hail Mary um, move. Hail Mary being in the last second of the American football game, they throw the, the ball towards the end zone just in hope more than anything else by firing nuclear weapons. Again, we can use deterrence to minimize that risk, but what is, what is he talking? He's talking about basically just letting them just letting them win here and like they're not gonna go forward and then not have any troops in Eastern Europe or Central Europe to stop them going fur further. That just seems very unconvincing to me as a strategy. They have seen hardships that those of us in the West can thankfully not even imagine. We will not cow them into submission. But we're not trying to cow the entire Russian population into submission. We're trying to persuade its leadership to leave here. What is he talking about? And he's talking kind of almost romantically about how the Russian people have gone through hardship. Yeah, that's part of maybe the problem why they don't do something about their idiotic government because the invasion is not in the interest of the Russian people whatsoever. There's probably over 20,000 dead Russians on Ukrainian soil. Their economy is going to be very badly affected. Their reputation as a country is in tatters, at least in the West. And the prospects for young Russians are not looking the best at the moment if they don't leave now and get the hell out. And the richest Russians are already leaving in the the report I saw recently, and actually also from China, they're, they're trying to get out now while they still have a chance with their money. So, again, for me, just very unconvincing. 
as they will not prove willing to lose. And it's not as though the economic sanctions have been working or have been without major collateral damage on a scale yet to be seen. The ruble is doing just fine and oil prices are not finished escalating. So he takes the ruble price. Again, it's another example when you're very far away from something, it's maybe hard to get a real sense of what is happening. So here, if you look at the official exchange rate, I have my app here, xc.com. I always rely on it. It says that one euro is worth 29.88 uh, hryvna, which is local currency here in Ukraine. Actually, if we put in dollars, it's going to, you're on the dollar on parity. So it's going to be, uh, why isn't this coming up for me? But anyways, it's going to be the same. It's going to be around 30 hryvna to the dollar or to the euro. Uh, if you go and exchange it this morning here in person, you'll get 36 hryvna. So you can see that, ah, uh, uh, the official rate, versus the rate on the street, not the same thing. So if you're actually a Russian person, it's going to be the same. You're not going to get that rate. A fantastic rate if you go and exchange money for hard currency. Of course, the currency is being, um, at least in the short run, it can be maintained at that level. That sucks, by the way, when you're paying by card because when I pay my foreign currency, of course, I pay with that 30 to 1 privna exchange rate, not the real exchange rate, which is 36 or 37. It was actually 37 yesterday. So, yeah, All not true. All this is enabling Putin to establish firm trading partners for his valuable commodities outside the direct Western sphere of influence. And the other Again, he has to sell his resources at a discount to those alternative buyers. Uh, he will still get a lot of money. Prices of, for his commodities are higher in the short run, but probably that's going to come down. Plus, he'll have to sell everything at a discount to the new buyers. Because uh, why else are they going to take it off them? They're in a strong negotiating position. They're not doing them a favor. They're opportunistic, 100%. Uh, so again, he's very rosy about what is happening to Russians as a people. I cannot see how we can defeat the Russians in any real sense. Because they will not allow themselves to lose. That's a bit like saying, I can't see how the United Kingdom can defeat Nazi Germany. Because Nazi Germany is not going to allow itself to lose. Obviously. That wasn't the case in the end because the United Kingdom, unlike what uh, Jordan Peterson is proposing, they got land lease from the United States. They stood firm. Churchill said, we will fight them on the beaches, etc. And in the end, they prevailed. Was it easy? No. But by standing up to the bully and the aggressive state that was trying to create basically almost, I guess, a global empire, um, Nazi Germany, eventually they won. And Nazi Germany went a lot further in terms of territorial expansion than Russia has and is likely to do with this invasion in Ukraine. Because the consequences even of an overwhelming military victory for our side will be internationally disastrous. And finally, because the quarrel that lies at one part of the bottom of this war will not disappear at all and may even worsen if the Russians somehow lose. With regard to that final point, the war of ideas that has given rise to the current real war will continue its destructive and nihilistic progress, even if the Russians capitulate and agree to the re-establishment of the pre-invasion boundaries. It is not obvious that while well, that war of ideas continues, that the Russians will even allow a prosperous Ukraine allied more closely with the West on their border. And it's wishful thinking to imagine that this war will end with the ignominious departure of a Putin in disgrace. Not only is he popular, but he is arguably much less terrible than almost any leader that has preceded him for a century in Russia. Again, he has a very rosy view of Putin's popularity. Do I think that Putin is popular? Unfortunately, yes, even though he launched this train wreck of an invasion. But is he as popular and is his popularity likely to last if this war continues? Ah, I'm very skeptical uh, that that's actually really the case. And is he less terrible than the previous leaders well he's probably from a russian's point of view so far less terrible than stalin was he less terrible than many of the other leaders that they've had mm, i don't really not so sure and as we go forward russia is now in process of put, moving from authoritarianism to totalitarianism becoming a real fascist state so things could get a lot worse for russians as well this is a war that cannot be won in the most fundamental sense by the mere defeat of Russia. The civil war in the West can only be won on the intellectual or even the spiritual front 
and the victory will be defeat of the radical ideas of Marxist inheritance that are currently destabilizing our societies, Russia and Ukraine included. It is the job of classic liberals. So then he tries to conflate the kind of culture wars in the West with uh, this war here in Ukraine by saying that the real enemy is, are the wokes. Never mind this Vladimir Putin guy. I mean, he's anti-woke as well. To give you a, an analogy that would be pretty similar, imagine you were to argue that, you know, in spite of all these terrorist attacks and what the horrors we've seen in Iraq and Syria by ISIS, that, you know, ISIS are also kind of, they're definitely anti-woke. You know, they're kind of in our civil war against the wokeists. They're kind of our friends. They're our allies. They're our natural allies. So, you know, why fight against those um, ISIS guys? Well, of course, ISIS is trying to destroy us. Just like Russia under Vladimir Putin is trying to destroy us. So that makes absolutely no sense to try to say, well, my enemy's enemy is my friend. No, my enemy's uh, enemy is also my enemy. <laughs> That's just the reality of it. Um, well, I'm hearing what I think is another air alert. So let's go on. I think it hasn't, I have an app that tells me, but I'm not getting official confirmation that we have one. We are at great risk of destabilizing the amazing interdependent world prosperity that is so unlikely, was so difficult to attain, and which we have enjoyed for only a few short decades. And we are taking that risk so blindly and willfully so, so stupidly, so childishly, and so pridefully. The hunger of millions will soon be upon us, and that is not all. Can we not get our priorities right and step back from that precipice? With the proper vision and aim, all could have all that is needed, perhaps even all that is wanted. Instead, we could have hell. We could have hell? Well, let me tell you, Jordan Pearson, maybe you should get off your ass and come here to Ukraine for two days and see what hell looks like, because it's already bloody here. And it's going to get worse because Russia is going to expand its war in Europe if it is appeased, because that's what the West has been doing since 2014. It's been appeasing Russia. We start off by taking a little bit, we're annexing Crimea, starting a war in Donbass. They had a war actually in 2008 by attacking Georgia. And the West, in effect, slapped their wrist a little bit, put on some sanctions, but basically did what Jordan Peterson is advocating, which is appeasement. And what do we get? A full-blown invasion of Ukraine that fortunately Russia is losing strategically and will be defeated before. if the West sticks in support and actually increases dramatic support for Ukraine. Anyways, I can't really watch any more of this appeaser. Circling back to what I said at the beginning of the video, one of his rules, his first rule for life is to stand up straight with your shoulders back and face the world. Maybe Jordan Peterson and you should be taking that piece of advice that you've so freely gave out uh, instead of being a little wimpy appeaser and saying, oh, it sounds like it's gonna be terrible if we stand up to these guys. Let's just like, let them do what they want because anyways, you're kind of anti-woke. So uh, yeah, those wokeist people, they're the, they're the real enemy. Not very cogent or convincing to me. It's a bit like, to give you the analogy, being in the Blitz in uh, the United Kingdom, which he alluded to and saying, yeah, you should just give in, just give. Give Germany, you know, Scotland and Wales. I mean, they'll be, they'll be happy with that. Maybe the south part of England to start with. No. <laughs> Thankfully, my grandparents' generation were able actually to stand up with their shoulders back and take out the aggressive self-aggrandizer that was Adolf Hitler. And Putin is making... He's never going to get that far, in my opinion, as long as we back Ukraine. I'm just end this video because someone sent me a message on Instagram with an article maybe explaining, I don't know if you really want to maybe sound like a conspiracy theorist, but let's just go for it anyways. And they sent me a report from Canadian News. I'm sure if I probably Google around to find it everywhere else. But anyways, apparently Jordan Peterson, and I did reference at the beginning about his uh, problem with an addiction problem to some drugs that he was taking 
I see the, I'll link it down below. Jordan Peterson seeks emergency drug detox treatment in Russia. And this is from February 7, 2020. And his daughter um, has a video here on YouTube where she outlines that, in fact, he has gone for emergency drug detox treatment in Russia. So he spent some time in Russia when he was addicted to drugs. Perhaps they helped him recover from it. Perhaps they didn't help him recover fully. Maybe he's become a little bit too uh, grateful for the, to the Russians for their help on that. And in fact, it's now coloring his judgment um, whether he's still addicted to drugs or not. Anyways, that is my reaction, Jordan Pearson. It was a big request in the last week or so since it came out. I find his video slightly disconcerting and a bit bizarre. The, 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 most of the video is about wokeism in the West and that we're in a civil war and basically uh, Vladimir Putin is with us, trying to help us. Bit like, as I said, imagine ISIS is with us. <laughs> Obviously, he's not, just like ISIS is not the friend of the West and liberal democracy. <laughs> If you think that's the case, then I feel a bit sorry for you. Maybe, like Jordan Peterson, you need some help. That's the end of the video. I don't even know if that was a full air, right? air alert or not. It was a bit strange. Uh, apparently when 7 p.m. it was fine, which was the beginning of this video. So in conclusion, I'm just gonna say, drop your comments down below. Slava Ukraini, Rom Slava. And I will see you in the next video. Greetings from this, farewell from this, well, farewell for now, hopefully only from a beautiful evening on the shores of the Black Sea in free Ukraine. Odessa Mama. Dopobachina. Sar Experience.